Welcome to the Real Men series, a series for men. We live in a time where there's great confusion over one of the basic truths of life. What is a man? Or what is a woman for that matter? One thing we know with absolute certainty, where confusion reigns, God does not. When God created us male and female, he did that on purpose and with a purpose. The Real Men series is intended to remind us why God made us the way that he did. It will help to remind men who they are in Christ. Real Men will help us to rediscover biblical manhood. God has called you to a higher purpose. He has called you to be a real man. Welcome to Real Men. Good morning, gentlemen. Welcome to the monthly men's breakfast. Those of you watching online, welcome. God bless you. We're going to continue our men's ministry series, Real Men Rediscovering Biblical Manhood. I don't know about you guys, maybe it's just me, but I've found in my life that there are times when people disagree with me. I don't understand it, I don't get it, since I'm always right and you know, all of that, you know? But the reality is it has happened. It happens to all of us. And it happens for lots of different reasons, even when we're perfectly right. Even when, you know, the position we take, our opinions or whatever, and they're perfectly right, which, you know, we can argue whether that's ever actually true, but there are gonna be people who disagree with us. You know, I can say, you know, these walls are a brownish color. I'm 99.9% sure that's an accurate description of the color of the walls. Somebody would say, no, they're a bluish color. Uh, okay, <laughs> I got, uh, uh, you're wrong, I'm right. And so, but you know, the reality is it doesn't matter where we go in life, doesn't matter what we do, there's gonna be somebody who disagrees with us about something. And <clears throat> differing opinions, different worldviews, we're living in a time right now where worldviews are really far apart. Um, and you know, political opinions and different things, really you know, a lot of conflicting um, opinions, desires, goals, and, and of course sin leads to disagreements. And so my goal for this morning is to discuss a, a pitfall that we as men can fall into. Now, when I, when I say pitfall, I want you to imagine a pitfall is the idea of a pitfall is it's a hole in the ground that is not obvious as you're approaching it and and it's meant to be a trap yeah and, and sometimes it's covered with different things but the reality is as 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 men we ought to be aware of our surroundings and watching for these things if we do actually come up to a pitfall we want to be careful not to fall into it right does that make sense if a pitfall is not a good thing, we want to stay out of it. And so we want to understand it. We want to identify it. And we want to stay away from it. Because if we fall into this pitfall, it is going to hinder our ability to be the kind of men that I believe God would have us to be, especially if we fall into it on a recurring basis, right? As, as men, just in life, you know, if there's a, a trap set for you, you know, if you fall into it once, okay. You know, maybe you just weren't, you weren't aware. But falling into it over and over and over again, that's not a sign of maturity or wisdom. And so we want to watch for this thing. So our topic for today is going to be conflict and its counterpart, reconciliation. So conflict and reconciliation are the two things that we come into the obviously conflict is the pitfall and rec reconciliation is the solution and so until you're perfect maybe later this afternoon um, until you're perfect the reality is that 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 the the pitfall of conflict is going to be a potential reality for us right would we acknowledge that's a that's a possibility um, you know, unless you're not engaging in life at all, you know, if you hide in a, you know, in a cave somewhere, you know, then you only have conflict with yourself and, you know, that's still probably a problem. Hiding in a cave is not an answer. Okay. Just know that, John. Can't hide in a cave. 
So what, one of the things I'm going to talk about, and I've talked about this before, and you guys are familiar with this, this concept because I've shared it before, is, is most people react to things. And, and talking about conflict, they would, you know, if conflict presents itself, they're going to react to it. <clears throat> That's natural. But what we want to do is respond to it. And there's a difference. We're going to talk about that as we go, as we go through this. Newton's third law. Anybody know it off the top of their head? Newton's third law. For, yeah, I'm going to say that again because the people online can't hear you. Um, <clears throat> for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. For example, if you insult me, what is my, you know, speaking of relationships, if you insult me, what is my natural reaction potentially going to be? To insult you back. But because I'm a sinful wretched creature, I'm going to up the ante a little bit, right? If Chad were to walk up here and punch me in the face, what would be my natural reaction might be to punch him back? Don't. Okay, Chad, leave me alone. Come on. So what we, what we ought to be doing is choosing a response, choosing the right response. The conflict is going to come. The, the, the pitfall is going to present itself to us. Somebody's going to come. There's going to be some, some disagreement, some challenge that comes to us, and there's going to be this opportunity for conflict. But, but instead of reacting to it in, in equal and opposite or, you know, you, know, you know, blowing it up, we ought to be choosing a response that's different than what we might. So let's pray, and then we'll get into this text for today. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time with these guys. I pray for your blessing over it. And Lord, as we get into this topic of conflict, Lord, we can't escape it. It doesn't matter what we're doing, where we're going. We can drive down the road and somebody might choose to enter into conflict with us. And so we pray, Lord, as we, get, as we go uh, forward with this talk, excuse me, that you would communicate to our hearts and souls and mind what it is you'd have us to know about this, that we would be more like Jesus as we as we move forward from this time. We praise you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So turn in your Bible to 1 Samuel 17. And in 1 Samuel 17, we have the account of David and Goliath. And we're familiar with that account. We've used it in other uh, men's ministry messages. It's an awesome account for that. But we're going to pick it up after David has killed Goliath. And so, you know, God did this radical thing that no one else in the nation of Israel was either willing or able to do or even attempt to do, David kills Goliath. It's a great victory. So we're going to pick it up in 1 Samuel 17, verse 54, and read down through 18.5. <clears throat> and David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. When Saul saw David... Going out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of his army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, as your soul lives, O king, I do not know. So the king said, inquire whose son this young man is. Then as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? So David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. You, know, I mean, you have to imagine this picture. It's a little graphic, kind of like in line with the movies that Larry appears to like. You know, he's, you know, <laughs> David's walking in with the, you know, the head of the giant in his hand, you know, like he's carrying a six pack of, you know, of, of non-alcoholic beer. Verse, <laughs> chapter 18, verse one. Now, when he had finished speaking to Saul, the, son, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day 
and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off his robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. Everything is looking awesome for David. Verse five. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servant. So David, we have to understand, is young. He's probably late teens. And God uses him to win this radical victory, this, this miraculous victory for the people of God. He instantly becomes a hero of Israel. And, and everybody is excited. Everybody is happy. Everybody's praising him. His YouTube videos are going viral. Everybody's following him on Instagram and Twitter, X. He's, you would think the whole world is, is excited about what is going on. Then, verse 6. Now it hap had happened as they were coming home when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Then Saul was very angry and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have, a, they have ascribed to David ten thousands and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now, what more could he have but the kingdom? So he eyed David from that day forward. And it happened on the next day that, it, that the distressing spirit from God came from Saul, upon Saul, and he prophesied inside the house. So David played music with his hand as at other times, but there was a spear in Saul's hand and Saul cast a spear for he said, I will pin David to the wall, but David escaped his presence now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but it departed from Saul. So David goes from <clears throat> this just euphoric, he's imagine he's a, he's a teenager, a young, this super young man, and he does this, this, this radical thing for God, and he knows who did it. He knows that God did it. But, you know, then all the people get all wound up about it and excited about it. There's no sense that we read in the scripture that Saul got, or excuse me, David got arrogant or prideful or anything like that about it. But you can imagine he's pretty happy to be in this circumstance. And all of a sudden, Saul, the king, is jealous of David's success. And so, and, and, and you get this sense that Saul is afraid that God is going to give the kingdom to David. Well, we already know that's exactly what's going to happen. And that begins a 20-year period of conflict between King Saul and David. Very one-sided conflict. The conflict all comes from Saul. But this morning I want to talk to you about three aspects of responding to conflict, remembering that, that our natural response is to react to conflict. And every time we react to conflict, it's 99% of the time is wrong and sinful. And God would say, no, I want you to think about it and choose a right response. First thing we need to do, first aspect of it, <clears throat> excuse me, take responsibility for your part. Take responsibility for your part. One of the ways you can tell that you've fallen into the, the pit of conflict is you don't pause to examine your side. You, you just always, all you do is the conflict is here, I must fight. That, and, that's our, and that's our natural response. I need to fight back against the conflict. I need to either protect my reputation, I need to <clears throat> defend my choice I need to and we go through all this process it's all about I must I must react to this and I must do it right now and I must do it aggressively otherwise you know I lose I lose reputation or I lose 
authority, whatever, whatever. Whatever reason we justify reacting to conflict, it's almost always wrong. There, there's rarely is it a good choice. But we need to ask ourselves, <clears throat> did I do anything or not do something that resulted in the conflict? Did I, did I cause or did I add to the, the situation, the environment, the, the, the parts, the pieces that resulted in a conflict? Because typically conflict involves two people, right? And so at least two people, it could be more than that, but it's at least, it's in at least two people. And, and if there's conflict, one of them is probably out of line. One of them is probably wrong. And it's a possibility that both are. And so we have to pause. If we're going to be real men of God, we need to pause and say, what's my part? Did I add anything to this? Did I cause this? Am I, am I the reason why this is happening? There's something that I did that caused it. Just jump down to chapter 20, verse 1, because that's what David does here. Then David fled from Naoth in Ramah and went and said to Jonathan, What have I done? What is my iniquity and what is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? David's saying, okay, what did I do? Now, you can imagine before he asked Jonathan this question, he's asking himself that question. What did I do that this is what Saul, how Saul is reacting to me? Did I cause this to happen? Now, conflict is going to come into every life. You cannot interact with other humans and not experience some degree of conflict. Now, that conflict might be relatively innocuous, you know, it, you know, I, I, you know, you know, you talking about having dinner, you know, I don't want chicken, I want fish, you know, you know, it could be something as simple and, and meaningless as that, or it could be something really significant. But the very first thing we understand is we don't want to fall into the, into the pitfall of conflict by reacting to it, by immediately asserting our will our authority, our strength, our whatever, because ultimately if it's coming out of me, it's probably wrong. <clears throat> but I need to examine myself. What did I bring? What did I contribute to this conflict rather than reacting to it? You know, the, you've heard me say the phrase, pause and pray. The idea is that, that we, we too often allow the, the flesh to react to whatever the circumstances around us. And we need to pause and ask, wait a minute, hold on. How should I respond to this? How should I, what is really going on here? What's the spirit at work here? All these different things we need to do to try to understand it. And then we, and then we, need, to, then we need to make a choice to, to not react, but to respond and our first response must be to humble ourselves before the Lord. We've got, we've got to humble ourselves before God and say, God, there's a conflict again in whatever it is. And, 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 you know, and maybe I contributed something to this. You know, maybe I know what that contribution was. Maybe I don't know. And I need you to, if I know what my, my contribution was, I need to confess that to the Lord. And if I don't know what it is, I need to ask him, Lord, Reveal to me what my part is in this so that rather than reacting to it, I take this moment to humble myself before the Lord that I might be able to understand because if I'm just reacting to it and my reaction is 99% of the time wrong, then, then it's probably wise to pause. Why, why not wait for a second, a minute, an hour, whatever it takes to spend that time searching your heart, knowing what you contributed, and then and asking God and, and confessing it to him, and then if necessary, then confess it to that other person. Now, even if your part is small, even if the other person's reaction is unreasonable 
or irrational, you should at least pause and, and, and seek to know what God's heart is about that. And I, I have, you know, and I think it's a good call, you know, if it's possible, to, to take a step even further than that and ask the person that I'm in conflict with what they think my part is. Tell me, what do you think I contributed to this? If I can't see it myself, the person I'm in conflict with has some sense that I, I have done something that caused the conflict, right? Would you say that's probably true? You know, and, and in reality, you know, often conflict comes from lots. I mean, some, of the, some of the most significant conflicts I've had with my wife, Kelly, have been miscommunication. We just, there was a misunderstanding. You know, she thought one thing, I thought another thing, and we made decisions or choices or whatever based on our different on misunderstandings, and then there was conflict as a result of it. And then very often just coming to it and say, okay, wait, hold, hold on. You know, what, you know, what's going on here? I thought this, you thought that. And, you know, working those things out can, can, can resolve that. As we look at the account, again, we only have what the scripture reveals to us. As we look at it, David hadn't done anything. In fact, what David did pleased the Lord. You know, if you're doing what pleases God, uh, you're not the problem, right? <laughs> if you're doing something that God says, that's what I want you to do, and you can sense that he's pleased with what you did, okay, you're not the problem. And, and there have been there have been times that I, like David here, found myself in conflict with someone through no fault of my own. I didn't do anything, just whatever. They perceived something, or they interpreted something, or they misunderstood something, and, and conflict was the result of that. And, I, and I've, I, I can tell you there have been lots of times where people have, you know, come to me and, and said, hey, I've got an issue with you. And I have no idea what they're talking about. I have no recollection of what they're talking about. But I'll ask their forgiveness. You know what it cost me? Nothing. It cost me nothing to ask their forgiveness. Even if I don't remember or they say something that they think I've done to them that I haven't done to them, it still cost me nothing to ask their forgiveness and to try to make it right. If you want to avoid the pitfall of conflict, pitfall of reacting, you know, because what, because what the, the pitfall is, it's there. The opportunity for conflict is there. And when we react, we're stepping into the pitfall. We're stepping into the trap. We must take a step away from that. And that first step is to take responsibility. I'm going to take whatever responsibility I can if I, if I have done something, if I had contributed to that, I'm going to confess it to God. I'm going to repent to God. I'm going to repent to that other person. I'm going to confess it to them. And maybe I might even have to fall on a sword once in a while and ask forgiveness for something that I am 99.9% .9 sure I didn't do. Okay. It cost me nothing. And all it does is help to reconcile, which is our goal, right? Second aspect of responding to conflict is don't take revenge. Don't act out. Don't strike out. There's something that happens when a man is attacked or feels like he's being attacked. Turn to Galatians 5. Galatians 5. When a man feels like he's being attacked, he has a natural response, right? That natural response is typically to lash out at the attacker. That's natural. God made us to be warriors, to be fighters. He, he, he hardwired us to be able to fight. Fight is part of what makes a man a man. In fact, if a man is unwilling to fight when it's the appropriate response to whatever the circumstance, he's not much of a man. And, and, and sadly, I think we're raising up a generation of something less than men. And you know, if, you, if you 
look at anything they're talking about, the military and recruiting and these different things. That's one of the things they're saying is that there's a real, there's a real problem with the mil in the military because we're raising up a generation of men that doesn't understand what it means to be a man. And that, that ultimately the military serves one major, what's the, what's the primary purpose of the military? To fight. To, to use lethal force if necessary. I mean, we, you know, the, the, the kind of military that will defend this nation is a lethal military. Not that we want to do that. No one, no one in the military should desire war or conflict or any of these things, but we must be, we must be able to do it. Otherwise, the, the military serves no real purpose. There will be some people say that we shouldn't have one anyways. Um, they're stupid. But. <laughs> Fighting is a part of the male nature, and to deny that is to deny reality. And God gave us testosterone for that purpose, so that we are able to fight and to be lethal when it's necessary. It's never... The, should never be the desire, should never be the first choice. It, it should always be something, but somewhere, and we talked about this right in the, the very first message in this series, that men should be able to, to be violent. That, that should exist within us. We talked about the reality and the image we often use, or we use for this series, the image of the lion. Jesus is, is both the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the worlds and the Lion of the tribe of Judah. When is he both of those things? Always. But when we saw him walking on the earth, which aspect of that did we see? Almost exclusively was the Lamb. And so that was, that was, that was I believe, a picture of what God would have us to be as men, that the Lamb is the nature that we ought to manifest most exclusive, I mean, almost without exception, but somewhere in us, that lion has got to be just there and ready. Should the need arise, that lion needs to be ready. So Paul tells us, though, this idea that, this idea that, you know, when, when we are attacked or we sense we're attacked, conflict, there's an element of conflict that feels like an attack sometimes, often. And our natural reaction to it is to fight. And Paul talks about that in Galatians 5, starting in verse 16. He says, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So he talks now about there's two, there's two aspects of us, all of us. There is the spirit and then there is the flesh. And then he goes on to say, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things you wish. There is a battle going on inside of us for dominance, for control. Either the spirit is trying to control us, he is trying to control us, or our flesh is trying to control us, and the one that is dominating is the one that's going to come out. Verse 18, but you are, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. This is why we don't want the flesh. This is a list of the things that will manifest if we let the flesh rule in us. The works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. These are the things that we allow the flesh to rule and reign. They will ruin your life. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. The, the, when we are allowing the Spirit of God, we, we are encouraging 
we're, we're denying the flesh, we're crucifying the flesh, we're putting the flesh to death, and we're allowing the Spirit to manifest in us, we're going to see the things in verses 22 and 23. If we don't, we're going to see the things in those previous verses, and they will manifest. Maybe not, as, maybe not to the degree that the, the, some of these things sound like, but at the very least, the shadow of some of these things will manifest. You know, you know, one of the things you murder, chances are nobody in this room is going to commit murder today. You know, but Jesus said, if you hate a brother in your heart, you have murdered him. And so the reality is that while we may not see the, the full fruit of some of these things, we'll see the seedlings. We'll see the little, the representations of those things. Adultery, you may not actually commit adultery, but you might fool around in some places where you don't belong. You know, some of, you know, I, you know the, the, the uh, pornography is a, is a form of adultery if you're a married man. We've got to be careful that we allow the Spirit of God and so if we're, we, if we're yielding to the work of the Holy Spirit, we're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. We're not going to do those things. And we, will, and we will be able to choose to respond to the things of God the way that God would have us to instead of falling into the pitfall and allowing those conflicts to blow up and to become you know, conflicts that, that get just crazy bad. Uh, go back to 1 Samuel. We're going to get to go to chapter 24. So just, just because someone attacks us doesn't mean we should always react by lashing out at them. That's the kind of the point that I want to get to here. Jesus is our obvious example of that. How many people attack Jesus? It happened all the time. You know, maybe not a physical attack, but they were coming after him all the time trying to trick him, trying to trap him, trying to get him to stumble in his words, and, and then ultimately they did physically attack him. Now, David had a couple of chances to react to the conflict between him and Saul. And here in chapter 24, verse 1, Now it happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Take note, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and went to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goat. So he came to the sheepfolds by the road where there was a cave, and Saul went in to attend to his needs. He went to relieve himself. David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. Then the men of David said to him, This is the day of which the Lord has said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. And he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing. To my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. Verse 7, so David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and went on his way. David, in, in the same way that, that Jesus, though so Jesus did it perfectly, trusted God, trusted God. God to be his defender, that he didn't need to defend himself. Jesus even taught about how we should respond in these kinds of circumstances, that if we are going to respond, that there has to be this, this idea of, of a limit to our response, and even, even more than that. In Matthew 5, 38 through 42, it says this, you have heard it's that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That comes out of the Old Testament, the Old Testament that if, if somebody harmed you in some way, that the limit of your response had to be no greater than what they did to you. So, so this idea of escalating revenge kind of a thing was, was forbidden. But I tell you, Jesus speaking, not to resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other one 
turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you and from who wants to borrow from him, from you. Do not turn away. And then in the Old Testament, in Leviticus 19, 18, it says this, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. We're also we're told to leave vengeance to God. Why? Because he's the only one that can do it perfectly. He does it perfectly. If we step in, whatever we do will be so much less than what God will do. Leave it to him. So first we take responsibility for our part, we confess that. Second, we exercise self-control through the Holy Spirit and choose not to react to these things. There may, there, there may ne- be a necessary response. You know, that, that's very likely, very possible. But if you react before you respond, your reaction is probably wrong and it will not give you the opportunity to respond in a way that glorifies God. Third aspect of avoiding the pitfall of conflict is seek to reconcile the conflict. Seek to reconcile. Anytime we get into conflict, we must always look past the conflict to reconciliation. That is God's goal. It's always God's goal. To reconcile means to cease to cause hostility or opposition or to harmonize or to settle it like a quarrel or conflict. Now, we can't always do that, right? We can't always reconcile. We look at the account of David and Saul. David could not reconcile because Saul was unwilling. And as long as Saul was alive, the conflict persisted. He was, Saul was unwilling to reconcile for for 20 years, the rest of Saul's life. As Christians, reconciliation is a part of our calling. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 18 to 20. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So God through Christ reconciled us to himself. He said, okay, you know, we were in conflict, right? You know, that, that's, that's the, the reality is before Christ, we were in conflict with God. Even when we are ignorant of, of that, Because of our sin, because of our rebellious nature, we were in conflict with God, but through Christ, we've been reconciled back to him. The the conflict is over between us. Verse 19, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the word to himself, not not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading Through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So, the ministry of reconciliation, one of the things as as ministers, as servants, as men of God, one of the things that we have to acknowledge at some point, one of my roles is reconciliation. With whom? Well, first, I need to make sure I'm reconciled with God. You know, I need to make sure that I'm right with God, that there's no sin in my life, no, nothing that is persisting that I have not repented of. But then reconciliation then goes from n- not just between me and God, but between other people and God. That's part of my, my role as a man is to, to, to be a vessel that God can use to reconcile other people to God. And, and not only that, but reconciling man to man, man to woman, woman to woman. That that reconciliation is also a part of what my calling is as a man of God. Now, as men of God, it's on us to seek reconciliation, to seek it first, to seek it to, to don't wait for someone to come and say, hey, you know, I, I want to reconcile with you. We, in, we are the ones that should be initiating, going out and saying, there is a conflict here and, and, and it does not please God. I can promise you there is no conflict in your life that pleases God. 
If there's a conflict in your life, it dis displeases God, and God would have it to be gone. He would have it to, be, to go away, and he wants us to initiate. And we should be willing to go to whatever lengths are necessary, whatever lengths we have to, to reconcile with whomever we must. In Romans 12, 18, it says this, if it is possible, there's a condition there, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. As much as depends on you, not as much as depends on them. As much as depends on you, whatever your part is, do that. Now, it doesn't mean that everyone's going to reconcile with us, right? Because it, the, it gives us a condition in the front. If it is possible, that the reality means that, that there are times when it's just not possible. You know, if, if, if you had a conflict with a, a parent and they're gone, you know, they've, they're, 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 they've passed away, you can't reconcile that conflict. You, can't, you cannot do it. You know, there's another process. It's just letting it go is, you know, there's the, what you have, eventually you have to do. But if you have, if that person, if it's possible, then you ought to be doing it. But only doing that part that you have to do. If they don't, if they're unwilling to reconcile, then, then, you know, you've done what you can. Doesn't mean you throw, you cast them away, but you do what you can. Do your part. Now, there are some who will, be re who will refuse to be reconciled to us, but we need to do what we can. And, and we need to do it as long as opportunities persist to reconcile. A and we need to keep doing it until God makes it, removes all the possibility, removes any opportunity for us to reconcile. Once there are no more opportunities to reconcile, then we, we basically, once he closes the door, then, then we're done. But until then, it should always be in our heart. Doesn't mean you have to drop everything and go do it, though there's probably a place for some of that. Um, you want to always keep that door open in your heart. Lord, if that person was willing, I would reconcile with them. And if God gives you an opportunity, then you should try to take it. One last thing before we close. There is one overarching principle that must be remembered if we're going to deal with conflict the right way. When we, when we are choosing, actually, and it really ultimately becomes the motivation for choosing to respond to conflict rather than following into the pitfall of conflict, and that is Jesus' command to us in Matthew 22, verse 34. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The, the primary motivation for reconciling conflict is love. First, our love for God. If God went to all the trouble to reconcile us to him by sending his son to die for us, then we ought to model that same love to our fellow man. And we ought to make that the reason, the motivation why we reconcile with others. It must be because we love God and we love what God loves. Which humans does God love? All of them. Now, it doesn't mean they're going to love us back. doesn't mean they're going to reconcile. But we ought to be motivated through a love for God and a love for his, our fellow humans that we are going to do our part to be reconciled. And so we must, we must continually through the process of, of dealing with conflict and, 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 and working toward reconciliation, ask ourselves, how can I love God and this person through this process? How do I do it? Because ultimately, that, that may not be obvious. It may not even be simple to do. 
And before you do anything, you have to ask yourself, does one, is this motivated by love? And does it communicate love? Now, that doesn't mean the other person that's going to receive it as love. Because we know if you tell somebody the truth that doesn't want to hear the truth, it is a very unloving thing. That's how they hear it, as an unloving thing, when in fact we know that when we tell someone the truth, and we, do, we try to do it in love, if we do that, it is an act of love, though they may not perceive it that way. But we need to ask ourselves the question, am I trying to communicate love to this person? Is that, my, is that my objective? Is that my goal to communicate love to this person? Because if it doesn't communicate love, if that's, not the, if that's not the foundation of it, if that's not the motivation for it, that means it's not a spirit-led work. It is a work of the flesh. And what does the flesh produce? Uh, we already read that in Galatians. Don't, don't, don't do it. Here's the reality, guys. Conflict is just a reality of life. You, you cannot escape it. Now, in my life, in my faith, I've come to realize that conflict is not always bad. We, we almost always see that. You know, that people, you know, conflict is bad. No, it's not, actually. Conflict, God uses conflict sometimes to reveal things to us that we wouldn't see any other way. Sometimes there are things in our relationship, there's things, there's things in my understanding of God, there's things in my understanding of his word, there's things of, of you know, relationships of the world around me that if God didn't grab me by the shoulders and give me a good shake every now and then, I would never see. And conflict is one of the ways that God shakes me sometimes, you know, that, that I'm, I am, you know, he's trying to show me something, that something is out of order, you know, and every time, if you're, if we're talking about our marriages, if, if there's a conflict in your marriage, there's two people involved, you know, God's there too, but we'll talk about the two people. One of them is not right with God because otherwise there wouldn't be any conflict. Possibility is there's two people that aren't right with God. And so conflict gives us the opportunity to see where one of us might be out of alignment with God. It allows us then to make a correction in our own heart and life and behavior or faith or whatever so that we can be right with God. Because if we're both right with God, our relationship is right and it moves forward in a way that is good and glorifying and, and growing. All conflict is an opportunity to glorify God, to grow faith and to bless others. And as men, we've got to make sure that when it comes, that we're not seeing it as the, as the, the great evil that some often perceive it as. We need to see it. Okay, God's trying to show me something. He's trying to teach me something. He's trying to make me into the image of Christ. He's trying to shape me and mold me to make me a, a, a better man, better husband, better father, better whatever. And this conflict is, a, is one of the tools that he's going to use. In Proverbs 27, 17 says, you know, that the idea of that, you know, that, that, that we as men, we, we need each other to rub against each other to, you know, sharpen ourselves. And conflict is one of the ways that God does that. You know, you sharpen a knife, you've got to grind it against something really hard and, you know, make the sparks and the heat and all that stuff. It's not a, it would, if, if the knife could feel, it would not be a pleasant experience, but that's what conflict does. It's one of those sharpening tools that God will use if we allow him to do that work that we pause and we ask ourselves what am i adding to it what is god trying to correct in me through this process that i'm i'm not assuming i'm not going to lash out at it i'm not going to take revenge i'm not going to i'm not my my initial response is not going to be to fight but i'm going to i'm going to take responsibility and i'm going to seek reconciliation i want to be right with god and conflict is one of the things that conflict reveals is I may not be right with God. That, again, you know, in this case of David, you know, he was, you know, he was, you know, if you will, he was, he hadn't done anything. And that's going to happen in life. But even then, when we are, are unfairly treated, 
somebody conflict comes for reasons that you know we're innocent if you will it still helps us to be more like Christ because even if we don't lash out I can promise you if conflict comes into your life your first thought is not good right I mean your first thought now what's the problem with your thoughts <laughs> sometimes your thoughts come out it comes out in your face it might come out in your hands it might come out in your words they might come out and so if it's if it's coming at all then God's saying okay we still got work to do conflict is always an opportunity for God to be glorified for others to be blessed and for our faith to grow so as men we need to make the decision to choose to respond to conflict in such a way that we are moving toward reconciliation if it's possible by taking responsibility choosing to exercise self-control and not resorting not reacting to that conflict and we need to choose to let the holy spirit lead us toward reconciliation to be an example of christ how christ dealt with these conflicts that came to him we need to choose our battles wisely battles will come sometimes we actually need to fight we need to, we need to stand on a hill and be ready to die on that hill but even then we need to do that in the strength and the power and the authority of god and not in our own but most of the time god's going to call us to resist the temptation to fight and instead to work for reconciliation real men don't go, go looking for a fight but if a fight comes and it's the only option, they'll do it. Real men don't create conflict. That's another thing to stay away from. If you're creating conflict, okay, that's a problem. But we always are seeking to reconcile, even if we did create it. Take responsibility for your part. Don't lash out in revenge. Take the initiative to seek reconciliation. Then trust God to work miracles in your life and to reconcile what in your heart and mind might be irreconcilable because with our God, he does the impossible. Amen? Amen? Heavenly Father, we do come and thank you, Lord, for this time. Lord, we know that that conflict, it, it comes. We'd like it to be otherwise, but um, until we're in your presence in heaven uh, in, and we're wrapped in the sinful flesh, um, conflict's going to come. Either we're going to cause it or it's just going to come because we're living in a fallen and broken world. But Lord, we don't, have to, we don't have to react to it the way most people do. We, because we have the Holy Spirit, we have the words of Christ, we have um, hope of heaven, we have you, God, and we can, we, can, we can respond differently. And so I pray for these, your men, that you would instill within their own hearts that reality that you've called us to something better, something greater, something, something more loving, something more beautiful than the conflict we see in the world all around us. I thank you, God, for these men. I pray for your blessing over them. And I pray, Lord, if they have conflict in their lives, that maybe they've seen or heard something here this morning that will help them through it um, to reconciliation. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We give this day to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for joining us for the Real Men series. It's our hope that these messages will help you to grow in your faith. If there's anything we can do to help you with that, or if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to connect with us. You can do that by going to calvaryfv.com slash connect to find all the different ways you can connect with us. In the show notes, you'll find links to other things from Calvary Chapel, French Valley, or other things that I have done. Please do not hesitate to connect with us if there's anything we can bless you with. Until next time, go be radical with Jesus. Thank you.